God has a plan and God has a purpose for all of our lives, doesn't he? You know, it's such a, an honor and privilege for us to have Reverend David McFarland and his precious uh, wife Diana with us here today. I've had the privilege over many years at different occasions to hear David minister and each time that he has shared, I've always come away encouraged and blessed and inspired. I appreciate his heart and his life become, because he comes to us with a pastor's heart uh, because he served in that capacity for many years. And today he is the uh, director of the National Initiatives for the uh, Billy Graham Evangelistic Association of Canada. David, I just really appreciate you. I appreciate your heart, your love for God, and the great blessing that you are to many churches and associations across, across our great nation. So I, will you welcome with me David Arrell McFarland. God bless you, David. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Pastor John. Wonderful to be here. What a beautiful building you have. Hasn't God been good to you? Yeah, he really has. God bless you. I have known Pastor John for a long time, and I feel very privileged to be here this morning as well. My wife Diana is here somewhere. There's my wife. You'd like to wave? I, she doesn't often come to, with me because I travel and speak across the country, but it's nice to have her in the audience. Uh, by, my wife and I are from South America. I was born in Uruguay. My parents are from Argentina. I speak fluent Spanish and English with an accent. Go figure. Okay. My wife was born in Buenos Aires as well, and uh, we both came to Christ later in life. I was 23 when I found Jesus, and uh, I met my wife on a blind date. My friend said to me, David, she must have been blind. <laughs> I took her home. It's a true story. I took her home from the blind date, first time I ever met her. Loved this lady. And I took her home and I kissed her on the forehead. And I said, I really like you. She looked at me with a twinkle in her eye and she said, a little lower, please. <laughs> so I said, I really like you. <laughs> I have a dream, and in my dream, in my dream, people here in Brampton that don't know Jesus will respect the church because they see an influence and something different in us, and they long to have what we have. I believe, amen, amen, amen. My dad was not a believer, and he said, you know, when the end of the world comes, I want to be in church. I said, Dad, you don't even believe in God. He said, yes, but everything happens 20 years later in church. Okay, I'll wait for you. <laughs> okay. A lot of people have the view that church is, is boring. And they couldn't be more wrong, could they? The best people I've ever met, I've met in church. Church has blessed me and encouraged me throughout my life, throughout my ministry, and I believe in the local church, and I'm so glad that you took the time to be here this morning and that you love God and you love the local church too. Yeah. But we need, but we need to realize that churches all have influence. All have influence. Some, unfortunately, have negative influence. They're not liked in the community. There are many churches, and I cross the country, who have no influence. None. They, that's us four and no more. Don't influence anyone. They keep to themselves. There was a guy who went to the doctors, and he said to the doctor, Doctor, I have a problem with snoring. Snoring. The doctor said, does the snoring bother your wife? And she said, he said, no, it embarrasses my wife. It's the rest of the congregation that it bothers. And there are people that fall asleep and church and Christianity is just something private that they do. They are what I call submarine Christians. They come up on Sunday and submerge the rest of the week. Okay? But God has called us to be an influence. God has called us not to live in here, but to make a difference. You see, the, the Satan doesn't care what we do inside the church as long as we don't take it outside. But the day has come when we need to take it outside. And we need to start to live out this faith, make an influence, make a difference for Jesus Christ in our world. 
I want to talk about that, about re-engaging, ramping up our influence. And the scripture I want to begin with is Jesus, who is the very first mention of the word church and how the church is called to be an influence on our world. And it's found in, in Matthew chapter 16, and it's coming up on the screen, Matthew chapter 16. And I'll read just first, what will I start with? Verse 18. So Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Simon Peter is there. First time the church is mentioned, and it says, And I tell you that you are Peter, meaning people like Peter, believers, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Wow. God's plan, Jesus' plan, was that the church, I want you to see a couple of things. Number one, he said, I will build. I will build. Meaning that you and I aren't where we should be. And there's no perfect church. Did you know that? If you find the perfect church, don't join it. Because you'll ruin it. Okay? Okay? But God hasn't finished working with us yet. And God has more to do in this church. And God has more to do in this community through this church. Because God's plan is that he will build. He says, and it's my church. God loves the local church. He does. And the gates of hell will not overcome. Everything will try to stop us from influencing our world, from influencing our neighbor, from influencing our people at work, from influencing anybody. Everything will be thrown against us for us to shut up, to feel quiet, to feel embarrassed, to, to be fearful. All the things that the enemy throws at us. But Jesus promises, he says, but the gates of hell will not overcome it. Satan cannot stop us. When we choose to be the influence for God in our community and in our world, nothing can stop us. Wow. Nothing, nothing will stop us. Jesus influenced his world. Wouldn't you agree? Just one guy didn't own anything, and yet what he had was so different that he influenced the history of the world. And you and I are believers today here because Jesus influenced way back 2,000 years ago. And that same influence that Jesus had, he has now given to you and me. We can become that influence for God. And especially in Canada. Canada is, was, is losing the gospel at an alarming rate. At an alarming rate. I have a map of the world which shows that the, the gospel is growing faster than the population growth in all countries except a few, about six. One of them is Canada, where the population is growing faster than the evangelical people are reaching others for Christ. Wow. But there's a spiritual hunger in Canada. I speak at conventions and conferences. I was in Red Deer, Alberta, speaking at a big convention, and between meetings, I needed coffee. Coffee? So I went to a Starbucks to get my espresso doppio macchiato $20 coffee o. <laughs> my, my wife and I went to Starbucks the other day and we shared a latte. I would have bought two, but I only had $10. <laughs> and this was in a chapter's bookstore. And as I was drinking my espresso macchiato thing, you know, and getting wired, I was looking at all the books, and I noticed that there were books uh, on religion. Now, years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, when I came to Canada, the Christian secular bookstore would have a religious section with four Bibles and two dead flies. <laughs> but now, you go to Chapters, Indigo, Coles, and you see row upon row upon row upon row of books on, on spirituality, on astral projection, and tarot card reading, transcendental meditation, and the last words of Oprah. <laughs> and the reason is because people are searching. Canadians are searching. They just haven't found Jesus. And they're not sure about the church because we haven't been as good an influence as we're going to become. Amen? We're going to be that influence again. So the people say, yeah, I need to think about going to church. Now, there are lots of words in the Bible used for, for explaining a church. We're going to put them on the overhead right now. It's called a body, a flock, and a body, and a branch, and a household, and a pillar, a priesthood of believers, a bride of Christ, a building. These are all illustrations of what the body of Christ is, is like and it's about. But if you go to the book of Ephesians, 
You'll see in the book of Ephesians, there's one of these many illustrations. And if you look at verse 19, it says this. Consequently, you're no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens of God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as a chief cornerstone. Meaning that the church is like a building being built and the chief cornerstone that holds it all together is Jesus. So that means that the church needs to be a safe place, a solid place a, a, where truth is explained, which you can believe in and you can count on. Then it goes on, in him the whole building is joined together, meaning that we need each other, that the body of Christ is where you come and find support and you find encouragement and you find prayer partners and you find people that love you and care for you. There's a sense of community that you won't find anywhere in the world because God is in this community. And then it says, rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. Holy temple, a place that's safe in every way. And then it says, and in him you too are being built. You too. Nothing to do with Bono. But you too, meaning you and me, are being built together. We're in process. My prayer this morning is that none of us will leave the way we came, but that God will speak to every one of us of how we can become more influential as followers of Jesus in this community of believers and outside in the streets and become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Meaning that of all the places in the world, this should be the most exciting place of all. In Mississauga, yeah, sure. In Mississauga, Mississauga, there was a, a contractor. And this contractor was building a, a house, one of these million dollar houses. And he was building the house and the first floor looked beautiful. When he started building the second floor, nothing lined up. The electrical didn't line up, the plumbing didn't line up, the stairs didn't line up. He was so frustrated trying to make this second floor work and it didn't work. Then finally he discovered he had the wrong plans for the second floor. You know, when we try to build the church the way we think it should be, because of our traditions or our experiences or our wants and likes instead of God's plan. We end up frustrated. We get angry. We get upset. It's not going the way it used to be. Nothing lines up. The only way to build a church is to go back to the manual and find out what is it that God is looking for. And when we build it God's way, it becomes a healthy, powerful influence in the world. In Peter, and this is a scripture I'm going to finish the message with, not right away. But in Peter, 1 Peter, chapter, chapter 1, no, chapter 2 actually, reading from verse 4. As you come to him, and by the way, this was written during a time of persecution. The church was being persecuted. People were against the church. They were killing them. They were throwing them to lions. They were crucifying them. They were, there was a hostile against Christianity, okay? This was not an easy time. But as you read this book of Peter, you find that it's an encouraging book. It's an inspiring book. And it's telling you, don't back down. Get out there and influence the world. That's what it's saying. And here he says, as you come to him, the living stone, there's the illustration of stone and building again, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Wow, God is doing this. Now there was a, there was a man who went to the doctors and he said to the doctor, he said, Doctor, my wife has a problem with hearing, but she won't admit it. She won't come and see you. Isn't there some way I could give her a hearing test without her knowing it? And the doctor said, yes, you could. All you have to do is wait till your wife is in the room with you, looking the other way so she doesn't see you, and yell out her name. If she doesn't respond, get a little closer, call out her name again. If she doesn't respond, 
Get a little closer, call out her name again, and you'll know if she can hear or not. So he gets home, and his wife's in the kitchen looking the other way, doing something. So he stands back and says, Margaret, 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 she turns with a chicken and a hand and a cleave and says, for the third time, what? <laughs> the problem is, we think that everybody else is the problem. If they only got their act together, the church would be fine. Huh? Maybe, maybe the one who needs to hear this is you. Maybe you're the one who needs to hear the message. So I'd like to talk about stones. We're going to see that on the screen in a moment. Stones. And I'm going to use the word stones as an acrostic for six things that every one of us can do to increase our influence. So I, I pray that you will say, God, what is it you're teaching me this morning? How do I need to change? I don't want to be deaf. I want to hear. I want to change. I want to become the influencer for you that I have the potential of being. Number one, the letter stone starts with an S. An S is for the word sincere. Sincere. And if you look at chapter 2, verse 1, it says, in First Peter, therefore rid yourselves of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. He's talking to Christians. Get rid of these things. The word sincere comes from Latin words, which means sin, sida. Sin means without. Sida is wax, candle wax. The word came into being because way back, five, six hundred years ago, during the time of people like Michelangelo, who were the great sculptors, they would make these big statues out of Carrara marble. And they'd be working sometimes for years to make this beautiful statue. And then at the last minute, they'd make a mistake and they'd chip the wrong way and there'd be a flaw in the statue. Or they'd break a finger off the statue. Now they couldn't sell it and all their two years of work went down the drain. So they would get candle wax, sera, and they would fill in the crack and smooth it over so it looked like the marble and they'd stick the finger back on so it looked like it was fine and they would sell it like if it was a real thing even though it was flawed. So when they would say this is sincere, sincera, it means what you see is what you get. If we want to influence our world, it starts really in here. Am I walking with Christ? Am I honestly the real deal? The real deal? Because people are looking at us in work, in the neighborhood, they see what we're really like. If we live a Christian life, a real Christian life, people will be influenced because they're drawn to what's different about you. There was a lady driving a car, and she had bumper stickers on it. And the bumper sticker said, God loves you. Jesus is the answer. Are you ready to meet the Lord? She was driving on the bumper of the car in front, honking the horn, yelling, out the window, move it, move it, you're too slow, come on, get with it. She started cursing and swearing, and she gave the bird finger to the guy lady in front and pushing the other car. A cop was behind. He put the lights on, and he pulled her over, got her out of the car, and she said, what are you doing, what are you doing? And he put her in handcuffs, and he said, I read the bumper stickers on your car. Clearly, you have stolen this vehicle. Maybe you don't have bumper stickers, but people know that you're a Christian or you wear a cross around your neck or they know you come to this excellent church. Is my life, is my life an influence for Christ? You see in verse 21 of this very same chapter, it says, it says this, it says, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. What Jesus did to influence our world with integrity, with love, with compassion, is exactly what will influence my world and your world 
when we start to live like that. The little boy, and he was in Sunday school, and they, they asked the children, what is a saint? This little boy who didn't go to church but had gone with his grandmother to a beautiful Catholic cathedral and had seen saints in stained glass windows said, I know what a saint is. They said, what is it? A saint is someone that the light shines through. But we need to wash the windows, don't we? To make sure that the light really does shine through. My prayer is that this morning as you sit here, God is speaking to you. And you say, I'm going to clean up this, that, and the other in my life. Not just for me and for my relationship with you, but because I want to be a witness by my life to those that are around me. God, help me to be sincere. I want to be sincera. I want to be the real deal. I want to be authentic. I want my faith to be authentic. God, this morning, I'm willing to make a commitment right here, a fresh commitment to God. I'm willing to turn and become that authentic witness for you. Sincere. Number two. In stones is the letter T. And that is together, together. You see, it goes on to say, it goes on to say in verse 4, it says, as you come to him, the living stone rejected by men and chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built, being built. How do you build a building with bricks and stones? You put them next to each other and you put them, glue them in place with cement. Well, that's the illustration that Scripture gives of what the church is. Okay? Glued together with cement. Okay? And you become this holy place. Okay? I had a friend called Juan Carlos Ortiz from South America. I remember going to his original, to his church, and uh, Juan Carlos told this story. He said, uh, at some job sites, they, they come and they put all these bricks in a stack at the job site, and then the workers come and they put them into the, to the building. But during the night, Satan comes with a, with a wheelbarrow and he picks as many as loose ones as he likes and takes them off and nobody even notices that they're missing. You see, once we have allowed ourselves to be committed to a local church, when we've allowed ourselves to be connected to one another and we're cemented together, Nobody can steal us because we're committed. Now, the problem is that I'm next to you. And worse, you're next to me. And you know, you might be Baptist. Or you might be Pentecostal. Or you might be Nazarene. Do I really want to be next to them? That's the point. We need to realize that we're all one in Christ. And we need to be willing to commit to one another. We're to commit to one another. Because when we're together, when we're together, we make a difference. I did something back in 10 years ago, 2005, for the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada, a national initiative right across the country. And we had people working together from all different denominations. And I was in Ottawa being interviewed by one of the many newspapers that interviewed me. It was the Ottawa Citizen, and this secular guy said to me, you mean that Anglicans are working with Pentecostals? I said, yes. You mean the Baptists are working with Presbyterians? I said, yes. He said, wow, you guys finally got your act together. The world is watching us. The world is influenced when we choose to work together. I want to give you an illustration. There was this little boy who went to a camp, a kid's camp. And in the kid's camp, he, he went to have fun, but he was missing his left, his left arm. Didn't have a left arm, just had the right one. And so everything was fine, and they, all the little Sunday school lessons and what they did at the camp was great. But they got to one where the teacher said to all the class, I'm going to ask you to stand. Would you mind being helping me just stand up here? Thank you for volunteering. <laughs> you want to come and stand right here? Yeah, let's give him a hand. Woo! <laughs> I'm David. Right, same name as before. Okay, good, 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 good. Okay. So I'm going to be the little guy that only has the right hand. But the teacher then said to all the kids, put your hands together. We're going to make church together. This is a church. This is a steeple. And then she suddenly realized the little kid didn't have a hand. But the little kid was really smart. He turned to his friend and said, 
I'll put my right hand if you put your left one. There you go. Let's make church together. This is the church. Let's go for the steeple. And this is the steeple. This is God's plan for the church. I don't have everything. You don't have everything. But I need you. And you need me. Right? But together, 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 we can build a church. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Let's give him a hand. Together, we can build a church. To be willing to participate together with one another. Wow. I was told a story years ago. I, I tell stories. That's how I learn. I don't know, do you? I don't forget them. We had a guy from South Africa come and speak, and he told a, a story that I'll never forget. He said in South Africa there were duck farms. Quack, quack, duck. Duck farms. And, uh, and he said everything was fine. It's a warm climate there. They don't need barns like we do. And all the ducks were kept in basically uh, fenced areas and there'd be this farm with fenced area with their ducks and this farm with their fenced area, this farm, and everything was fine until there was a flood and the water of the river came up and it flooded all the farms and the water started to rise higher and higher and they found out the ducks float And the water started to go higher and higher and higher until it went higher than the fences that they'd all put up. And all of a sudden, all the ducks became one big duckery. Okay. And then he said this, the Holy Spirit around the world today is trying to take us from our fenced areas and move us by the love of God above our differences to realize that together, together, we can influence our world far better than we ever can on our own. But are you willing this morning to allow God to move you from where you are? Are you willing to allow the Holy Spirit to help you rise above your fears, above your prejudices, above the barriers, above your indifference, Maybe about your comfort zones? Are you willing? Because the moment you are, God can raise you up. And then we will be seen by the world as being together. And that alone will influence them. Are you willing? Are you willing? Are you willing? Mm. Number three. Number three. S, sincere. T is for together. O is for others. Others. Huh. Can you believe that? Others. And it goes on to say in verse 5, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifice. A holy priesthood. Now, if we are holy priesthood, that's what we all are. We all are. How many of you are, are, uh, are missionaries? Anybody a missionary? Okay. How many of you are, are part-time saved? Anybody part-time saved? How many of you are full-time saved? Okay. How many of you are missionaries? Every one of us. Every one of us. You see, our high priest, Jesus, washed feet. He taught us by its example that Christianity is not about me. It's about others. That's what a priest was about. A priest was to help people to encounter God... And he helped them to, to encounter the Lord. That's my job. That's your job. Woo! I'm having a revival here all by myself, okay? okay. okay. It's about others. You, you know, we don't influence our world very well because often we're about me and me, me, and not others. There was this man who came into a church like this one, and he sat near the back with a big hat on, a big Stetson hat, like a big hat. And so the usher, not Michael, <laughs> another usher, came up to the man, the service was about to start, and said, sir, would you mind taking the hat off? The service is about to start. And the man said, who are you? Well, I'm the usher, my name is Bob. Good to meet you, Bob. 
but he left his hat on. So Bob immediately went to one of the deacons and said to the deacon, that man's got his hat on, would you go tell him to take it off? He didn't listen to me. So the deacon goes over, and now the service has started, and he goes over to the man with the hat, and he said to the man, sir, would you mind taking your hat off? My name is Fred. I'm, I'm one of the deacons here. Good to meet you, Fred. But he left his hat on. So Fred went to the elder, and the elder came along, and he said, hello, my name is, is, is Barnabas, and I'm the chairman of the elders here. Would you mind taking your hat off? And the man said, good to meet you, Barnabas. But he left his hat on. Then the pastor finished the service thrown by that guy with a big hat and went down and said to him after the service, sir, did you know you had your hat on the whole time? And the, pastor, the man said, yes, I did. I've been attending this church for six months. I haven't met anybody all, in the, all six months. But today, because of the hat, I met the usher, the <laughs> deacons, the elder, and even the pastor of the church. We need to realize that if we're going to influence our world, we've got to start paying attention to others and doing what it takes to reach out to others. I pastored a church in Chilliwack, British Columbia. And it was God, it was very good. The church grew, multiple services and all that. One Sunday, there was a, an old lady showed up at the church. You don't mind me telling you stories, do you? <laughs> this old lady showed up at the church and, and uh, I, I met her after the service and said, how are you? And she told me her name with a German accent. She was Mennonite, I guess. And I said, did you live in Chilliwack? She said, no, I live in Abbotsford, about half an hour away. And we go to, my husband and I go to Northview Church. And at that time, Northview Church was the most cutting-edge church, certainly in British Columbia, maybe in Canada. They did weird things with helicopters and big stadiums, like it was a cutting-edge church. They did the latest choruses, and they never sang hymns, and they were into dramas. It was very, very modern church. But this was an old lady. And then she said to me, my husband and I, we were founders of that church. I said, you started that very contemporary church? She said, yeah. I said, you must have had to give up your King James Bible. And she said, yes. They used a new translation. Yes, I had to give it up. That must have been difficult, she said. Yeah. You had to give up singing hymns. You, you must have loved hymns. Yeah, I love hymns. Yeah, we don't sing hymns. That must have been difficult. She said, yeah, that was difficult. I said, you had to give up singing in four-part harmony, which is sacrosanct to Mennonites. That must have been difficult. She said, yeah, that was difficult. I said to her, was it worth it giving up all those things? And she started to cry. And she said, Pastor David, every Sunday the church is full of young families and young people and children. We see people saved every Sunday. We see people baptized every month. Oh, pastor, I would do it again in a heartbeat. I was crying now, and I said, you're one of my heroes. And I hugged her. She hugged me back. We were both crying now. Then she said this to me, the old lady, 18-something-year-old. She said to me, I learned long ago the church is not about me. Not about my wants and my likes and my preferences. I can be selfish too, she said. It's about others. I will do whatever it takes to reach the next generation. Amen. We want to influence our world. It's got to move our focus from me to the world, others. Takes me to the next one, which is S-T-O-N. N is for, believe it or not, for nice. It's nice because it fits in the acrostic. Nice. I want you to see the scripture. It says, it says in verse 9, it says this, verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you did not receive mercy, but now you have received mercy. I believe that people, 
that belong to God, that are a holy nation, that have received mercy, should be nice. Doesn't that sound like an idea to you? Yeah. We start to influence our world when instead of being known as being judgmental and hypocritical and anti-gay, which is what the culture, they tell us, sees us, when we start actually being nice, it makes a difference. I pastored Islington Evangel Center here in the city for quite a 16 years, actually. I remember one day when a transvestite came to church. It was a man dressed as a woman. He looked pretty good. He looked better than some of our women. No, just go. <laughs> and this guy came into church and he was cursing and swearing in the lobby and trying to, he was quite a deal when he went to the washroom. Okay, just so you know. And so this, this was quite a deal. And he, I don't know why he came, but, but he probably came to shock the Christians to show how hypocritical, how anti-gay we are. I don't know. But he showed up in the lobby. To the credit of the people in the church, not to me, to the people in the church, instead of them looking, we don't do that around here, you know, they went up to him like Jesus would do. And they reached out to him like Jesus would do. And they touched him like Jesus did to lepers and people that are broken and hurting. I'm pushing buttons, aren't I? Good. And they went up to him and they talked to him and, and they invited him out for coffee and he disappeared. He showed up a few months later and this time he was a skinhead. Skinhead and, and, and big hobnail boots. And again, the people from the church, instead of he was cursing and swearing again and pushing himself around, and he had tattoos all over himself. Have you wondered about people with tattoos? Don't they know one day they're going to get old and that eagle will be flapping in the wind? <laughs> yeah. and, and the people from the church got to know him, took him out, found out that he had a drug problem, that he was a male prostitute on Young Street, uh, Young Street or Church Street or Jarvis Street in Toronto. And, and here he was, so they took him out to lunch and then he disappeared again and came back a few months later and this time he had piercings all over his body. In fact, so many that if you had a magnet in your pocket, he'd follow you wherever you went. <laughs> yeah. And again, the Christians, instead of saying, oh no, weirdo, they went over and they befriended and they got to know him and they ended up, I found out, getting him into a drug rehab program. And I remember about a year or two later, the day that he went into the baptismal tank, he had a mohawk that day. The biggest mohawk you've ever seen. Red and blue and green and yellow. We learned something that day I didn't know, that gel is water soluble. <laughs> and in the tank, this guy with this huge mohawk, a lady in the audience said to her daughter, his hair doesn't look natural. To which she said to the mother, neither does yours. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> And in the tank, in the tank, in the tank, he talked about how he came to know Jesus Christ. And it wasn't the preaching that did it. It was the fact that the Christians were nice, loved him, reached out to him. And they influenced him so much by being nice that they led him to Christ. And it was the actions that spoke louder than the words. And when we baptized him, he came back up, no more hawk now, if all slick back, where'd the other guy go? If we want to influence our world, if we started being nice, if we started being good Samaritans, we would influence our world in no time. I was reading just the other day about the church in, in China and how the persecution, and, uh, and in the city of Beijing, there are 60 now 60,000 believers and over 5,000 believers come to Christ every week in the city of Beijing. And they were asked, how did this happen? He said, well, at the beginning, nobody wanted us to build a church in our, their area. They said, we're against churches. You know, you've never had a church. We don't believe in it. But now they welcome us. 
because they found out that our people care for others, we feed the homeless, we look after the broken, we heal, we pray for, we encourage. Now they want us there. It starts by being nice if you want to influence your world. Let's go to the next point. It's okay, you don't have to clap. Okay. And then is E. E is for evangelism. In verse 9 it says this, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. In other words, it's not enough to do good things. We also need to declare. We need to speak. We need to show people how they can come to know Christ. Uh, I was born in South America. My parents were Argent from Argentina. None of them were missionaries. We were all heathen. And I didn't come to Christ until I was 23. And I did because somebody went to, uh, to Buenos Aires, Argentina. It was a Thursday night. I was 18 at the time in a little Baptist church. And a guy that I knew from school who was a weird Christian guy that we made fun of invited me to see an illusionist, a magician, who, who uh, called Andre Cole. And he gave me a ticket that said worth $5. And he was giving it to me for free. My name is David McFarlane. McFarlane's a Scottish name. Scottish people like to be cheap. So this was free. Do you know why Scottish people have big noses? Because air is free. Okay? <laughs> and so, so he invited me. So I went, 18 years old, to this church. I did not go to church, really. I wasn't a church goer. I sat like maybe you're sitting there this morning. And he did an illusions and tricks, and he was really good. And then he told about Jesus. I didn't read the small print on the ticket. It said, sponsored by Campus Crusade for Christ. And he gave the gospel. What is the gospel? I'd never heard it. I'm going to give it just in case you're here, and you've never heard it either. I had never heard that, that God loved me and had a plan for my life. I never heard that. I didn't know that Jesus said in John 10, 10, I, Jesus said, I have come to give you life and to give it to you abundantly. Christ has come to give us a life that is fulfilling, that is meaningful, that is significant. The tragedy is most people don't know that and never turn to Christ and never enjoy that abundant life that Jesus came to give us. But it's available to us if we want it. I didn't know that, that God loved me and had a meaningful life for me. I was always wondering, it's got to be more to life than this. Do you ever ask that question? I don't know. And then he said that, that we are sinful and separated from God because the Bible says for all of sin are short of the glory of God. Well, I knew that because I've done enough wrong things in my life to know that we, I was a sinner. And God is holy and sin cannot live in the presence of God. And all the things that we do to try to, to get God's favor, be a good life, you know, be a better citizen than the next guy, nothing's good enough because to get to heaven you need a perfect score and nobody has a perfect score. So God did something for us that we cannot do for ourselves. He sent Jesus Christ to be born of a virgin, to live a sinless life, and to die on a cross, as you're going to celebrate Easter next weekend. I hope you'll all come. Good Friday and Sunday morning. And bring your friends with you, as Pastor John said. And so Jesus died on the cross for my sins, to pay for my sins and yours in a way that I will never understand. He took my punishment so that he has given me and you the free gift of forgiveness and the free gift of salvation. We, but we need to receive it. Many of me, us, including me, are too arrogant and proud to think, to say to God, I need you. I can't do it on my own. I need you. The Bible says that for all of sin, for sure, the glory of God. But it also says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And it's a gift. And so sitting there in that pew that, mo that evening, I, I wondered if there was a God. I didn't respond. I was arrogant and proud and stupid, not necessarily in that order. And it wasn't until I was 23 at university, very successful in business, but inside, brought up an alcoholic, abusive home, broken, hurting, angry, angry young man. And I came to a little church on a Sunday, and I sat maybe where you're sitting. I didn't even know if there was a God. And so I remember saying, I've been trying to do it on my own, and I'm not full. There's something missing, and I can't find it. I've tried everything to fill it. Maybe that's where you're at this morning. You're a good person. You're a smart person. You're, well, you're intelligent. You're good-looking. You've got everything going for you. But there's something missing, knowing there's an emptiness in your life. That's what I felt like. 
And I thought, as you can this morning, what have I got to lose? God, I prayed, remembering what I'd heard when I was 18 from that magician. God, I confess that I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness. Please come into my life. I don't fully understand all this, but Lord Jesus, make me new. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. God specializes in turning our lives around as only God can do. Maybe that's where you're at this morning. You want some power to turn your life around, to go from where you are to where you could be. God is here this morning. God is, loves you. And he's just waiting for you to say, God, I need you. I've tried to do it on my own. I surrender. If that's where you're at, that's where I was at. I'm going to lead you in a prayer that I prayed. And with that prayer, I began a relationship with God, and I've never stopped since. That doesn't mean I'm perfect. doesn't mean I haven't had my struggles, but it means that I have faith and hope and God with me in the tough times of life. But it started with that prayer. In China, they say that every long journey begins with the first step, and this is the first step. I'm going to invite you to close your eyes and bow your heads in prayer across the auditorium this morning. And if you're here and you, you came with someone or you know people around you, would you pray for them now? Would you just take a moment to pray for them right now? Let's just take a moment quietly to pray. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for the men and women that took the time to come this morning. None of us are here by accident. You knew that we would come, that we would come. Lord, you have a divine appointment for a number of people here. People that have walked with you and have walked away, but this morning they want to come back to you. People that have never began their relationship with you, but this morning they want to go from, from pretending to be a Christian to being the real deal. So I invite you to pray along with me. And this is between you and God, and it goes like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I confess that I am a sinner. I acknowledge my sins and my mistakes. I come, I've tried to do it on my own, and I haven't got any better. I surrender my life to you, Almighty God. I don't understand it all, but I invite Jesus Christ to come into my life to be my Savior. Forgive me for my past. Wash me completely clean. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to walk with you from this day on and grow in my faith. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you really meant it, I believe that something will have happened in your life. Now, this is a very good church. So we're going to be praying for people later here at the front. If that's you, please come forward and speak to me or to one of the altar workers. You have altar workers, Pastor John, right? Please come forward and, and be here. Uh, I have done this myself, walked down the aisle many times, and each time it was one more move towards God in my life. So we looked about E was for evangelism. We need to share the good news. And then finally, I'm going to the last one, which is S. The last one, woo! Okay. The last one, S, is for society. You see, it says in verse 12, it says in verse 12, it says, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good works and deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. That even the people who don't believe will be influenced by the way you live. Isn't that something? So we need to influence our world. Let's go to the next slide and look at it again. What did we see? We saw that number one, God this morning, I want to be sincere. How many of you that's you? That's me. I want to be the authentic faith. I don't want to be plastic. don't want to be a Pharisee any longer. Okay, God, I want to be sincere. Help me to live an authentic life that's attractive to the people and influence them. Together. Thank you, God, that we, are, we can work together, that I can get involved, that I can support, that I can pray, that we can stand together as a church in Brampton. Three, it's for others. Help me to stop seeing myself as the center of the universe. Help me to start seeing opportunities to serve others and be nice, be nice to them around me. God, thank you that you've given all of us the gift of evangelism, every one of us. Help us to share the good news of the gospel when the opportunity is right, and help us to impact society. Amen. I'm going to give an invitation in just a moment. But before I do, I have a couple of things. One is that I have some videos that they're free. Free? Okay. 
and they're put out by Billy Graham. They cost millions of dollars to produce, so I do need you to put your name on a card just to, so we know you picked it up. All you need to put your name in the church, the church, so we know this is where we picked it up, because the people that donated the millions of dollars want to know that it's going to be used. This is a video that can be shown to an unsafe friend or a neighbor or a child or an uncle, and it clearly presents the gospel. I have about six different ones out there, and they're all free. So if you fill out the card, pick that up, that's great. I also have a book for sale. It's called Ignite Your Life, Living for Significance. It's based on Mark chapter 2. It's totally different than this message, but the jokes are different, but not any funnier. Okay, this is actually a bestseller. It's in its third printing. It's a bestseller in Canada. Ignite Your Life, Living for Significance. It's $20. I'd be happy to sign it for you. If you like, I'll be at the back. Just pick it up, just $20, and that's it. I'm going to close. Okay, am I? I'm, I'm going to close. I want to close with a story, of course. I want to close with a story because I want you to see that influencing the world is not as complicated as it sounds. That every one of us, every one of us has the power to influence our world. And it can be simple. There's a lady called Mrs. Thompson. Mrs. Thompson was a school teacher and in her class was a, a little boy called Teddy Stollard. And Teddy Stollard this little kid was always late for school and came badly dressed and his homework came with coffee stains and spaghetti on it and, and he was a poor student and she got a lot of satisfaction giving him an F for failure. And everything went like that until one day it was the teacher's birthday and the kids brought presents for the teacher. And so the teacher opened the presents and went ooh and ah and the kids took their cue from her and, but to her shock, Teddy Stollard, the kid who was always late, badly dressed, brought a little paper bag and said, this is for you, Mrs. Thompson. Mrs. Thompson opened the paper bag, and in the paper bag was a rhinestone bracelet with half the stones missing. And a bottle of chief perfume, half of it used. She sprayed it on her wrists and went ooh and ah. All the kids took their cue from her and went ooh and ah. After the kids had left, Teddy Stollard, the little boy, stayed back. He went up to Mrs. Thompson and said, Mrs. Thompson, you smell just like my mother. And her bracelet looks really good on you, too. She went home that evening and got hold of all the files that she had on all the students, and she looked up Teddy Stollard and found out that, that he had been at, at the top of his class in the first two grades. But then... It said that his mother had died of cancer and his father didn't know how to handle it so the kid had been trying to do everything on his own. That next day there was a new teacher in the class. Oh, it was Mrs. Thompson. But she had had a change of heart and a change of thinking. From that moment on, she took special interest in Teddy Stollard and all the kids that weren't doing well. She did remedial classes and helped them privately took time to help them, and by the end of the class, the end of the year, Teddy Stollard had gone from the bottom of the class to about halfway up. A few years later, Mrs. Thompson gets a letter in the mail, and it says, Dear Mrs. Thompson, I wanted you to be the first to know that I graduated from high school. How about that? A few years later, she got another letter in the mail. Dear Mrs. Thompson, I wanted you to be the first to know that I graduated with a bachelor's degree. How about that? Then a few years later, Mrs. Thompson got a letter, said, Dear Mrs. Thompson, I wanted you to be the first to know I got a master's degree. And then a few years later, she got another letter. Dear Mrs. Thompson, I wanted you to be the first to know that I am now Dr. Theodore M.D. How about that? And then she got a final letter. And this letter said this. She said, my dad passed away a few years ago. I met a wonderful young lady, and we're going to get married on May the 7th. I wonder if you would be good enough to come to the wedding and sit in the seat where my mother would have sat because you're the only family I have left. Do you think she went? What did Mrs. Thompson do that influenced this child to go from a failure to a huge success? What did she do? She influenced her just simply.
by encouraging, by taking an interest. If everyone in this room, with the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus, stopped looking inward and started looking outward, we could influence Brampton and the people be flocking to this church because that is what's needed in our world. I'm going to invite you to stand. It's okay. I invite you to stand. We're going to close. We're going to close, but I want to leave the altar open. Okay, don't forget to pick up videos. They're free uh, to, while supplies last. Don't they always say that on TV? And I also want you to pick up that book if you can afford it. The, uh, the book is $20 called Influencing, Impacting, or whatever it is the book's called. <laughs> anyway, and I'd be happy to sign it for you. But let's just take a moment to just close quickly. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, I'm going to give an invitation now. And Lord, you draw, draw the people that, that need the prayer forward. Uh, the people that really want to see life change. The people that really want to go to the next level with God. The people that are not satisfied with who they are today, but they want to become that powerful influence for God like they've never been before. I pray, O oh God, that you would draw them by your Holy Spirit to the front of this church. And by doing it, Lord, you will meet with them in an incredible, powerful way. That, Lord, they will leave with a fresh anointing, with a new sense of your presence, that those that come forward will be blessed beyond measure. And I ask you to do it in Jesus' name. Amen. So God bless you. You can leave now, but if you lead prayer, please come forward. We'll stay here with you. I invite the altar workers to come forward.